Hey Mick Killer, as promised, this is a response to the video response that you made to my video response to the other video response, and once again, this is getting kind of confusing, so let me quickly say thank you very much for your reply. I appreciate it. I thought it was thoughtful um, uh, and, and very much uh, worthy of consideration, so um, I always appreciate anyone who's willing to engage in a discussion like this. Your attacks on uh, uh, coherentism, uh, you said a, a couple of different closely related attacks, you say coherentism uh, leads to a vicious infinite regress, you say coherentism is circular, you say it's question begging, etc. and so forth. Um, I actually think that image that you used is really quite nice. Um, it's oversimplified, of course, uh, but the basic idea is there. I mean, in actuality, we have way more than eight beliefs, of course. We have probably thousands, if not millions, depending on exactly how you're going to count. Uh, and not every single belief connects to every other single belief, uh, but I, th I do think that the basic idea is captured in that nice little graphic that you had there. You also say it's circular, and I guess that kind of depends on what you mean by circular. If you mean that each element is justified in terms of other aspects of the system, as opposed to some fundamental foundation, then sure, yeah, it, it's circular. Um, but that's not an objection, that's just an articulation of the theory. It's just another way of talking about coherentism. On the other hand, if by circular you mean that it's a system such that it can't legitimately justify any claim, because any claim uh, in such a web is acting as part of its own justification, and hence the justification is fallaciously question-begging, then that's where I would disagree. I don't think it's circular in that sense of the term. Here's something that might actually help clarify things a little bit. Consider the difference between a vicious circle and a virtuous circle. A vicious circle is a logical fallacy for obvious reasons that I don't think I need to get into, but not every circle is vicious. Think about an example from economics. If people think that the economy is doing well, they'll be more likely to spend money, they'll have greater consumer confidence, etc. and so forth. At the same time, if people spend money and have greater consumer confidence, etc. and so forth, this will actually cause the economy to improve. And in turn, that will cause people to think the economy is doing well. So it looks here like we have a circle. You know, people think the economy is doing well, so they behave in such a way that makes the economy well, which makes them think it's doing well. Well, exactly where is the, 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 the cause and where is the effect here? Uh, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's circular. It's dog chasing its own tail. Um, but this isn't fallacious. This is actually how economics works. It's more complicated than that, of course. Again, this is an oversimplification. Uh, but it is indeed one a simplified but true way of ex uh, describing how uh, psych economic psychology works here. Consider another example that I used my, in the comments section of the previous video. If I ask the question, what holds up my desk right here? Uh, immediate answer comes to mind. The Earth. Well, if I ask the next question, what holds up the Earth? Things start to get a little tricky. You know, if you are a ge uh, geological foundationalist, then you, know, you might start to quickly think you're running into a regress problem. I mean, if the world stands on, say, the back of a giant turtle, then that turtle has to stand on the back of another turtle, and the next thing you know, it's just turtles all the way down. But, of course, today we understand a thing or two about gravity and how massive objects attract each other. So, here's where things get interesting. It's not just the Earth that holds up my desk. It's every massive object on the Earth, since they all contribute to the gravity well that the planet is resting, resting in. So, you know, there, there's another desk in China somewhere on the opposite side of the world. That's a non-zero mass. That, it's exerting a gravitational pull on this desk. and that's, So that desk is also holding this desk in place, as is every other object on the Earth is playing a part of the gravity well that's holding my desk down. Uh, so that means, in a strange sense, my desk is holding itself up. Uh, in the same sense that the planet is holding itself up. That might seem circular, and in a sense it is. But nonetheless, it can't possibly be a logically unacceptable vicious circle, because it actually describes the way the world works. So it must be a virtuous circle. Now, moving on to your discussion of the Big Bang. The questions you ask are things like, why did the Big Bang happen? What caused the Big Bang? What's a sufficient reason for the Big Bang? Well, I, I already addressed the, the, the point about what caused the Big Bang. I think, you know, I, I believe, my understanding of Big Bang cosmology, not, not, a, not a cosmologist, not a physicist, but, you know, I've, I've read 
Einstein and Hawking, Brian Greene and so forth, and they all, they all seem pretty clear on this. Um, the question, what caused the Big Bang, is a nonsense question. But none, uh, and nonetheless, maybe your version of the question, what's a sufficient reason for the Big Bang, might be an improvement. Um, this, is, this is the way you phrase it. I hope, I hope this is an adequate summary of, of your version of the principle of sufficient reason. You say, if everything that exists contingently has an explanation beyond itself, then the universe must also have an explanation beyond itself, because obviously the universe is a contingent entity. Um, phrase thusly, uh, I, I am going to reject uh, the principle of sufficient reason. You're absolutely right about that. And I'm going to do so for several reasons. Uh, for starters, uh, I have absolutely no confidence at all in our a priori modal intuitions. You say the universe is contingent. How do you know? I can think of no clear way of establishing that claim. You might try some sort of Cartesian method. Well, I can imagine the universe not existing, or something like that. But what reason do we have for thinking that human imagination is any kind of reliable guide to understanding what is necessary and what is not? The most brilliant minds of the last 3,000 years thought all five of Euclid's postulates were necessary for coherent geometry. They were all wrong. Every mathematician from Pythagoras to Russell thought that the incompleteness of mathematics was inconceivable right up to the point where Kurt Gödel proved with logical certainty that not only is it conceivable, it's actual. Mathematics is in fact incomplete and must be incomplete. I can imagine a world in which uh, proof of the Goldbach conjecture is found, but that doesn't mean such a world is possible because there may be no proof of the Goldbach conjecture. It may be unprovable for all I know. Now, I could go on listing failures of human modal imagination, but I really do hope that's enough to show that uh, the, 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 our, our instincts here are not going to be reliable guides to what is necessary. So maybe the universe is not uh, a necessary entity, but maybe it is. Uh, I don't think we're in any position to judge on that one. Furthermore, uh, I can actually think of many counterexamples to your principle of sufficient reason, and, and none is perhaps uh, any clearer than uh, something that falls under the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, in particular an issue known as quantum entanglement. Um, now, it's really complicated. I don't have time to go into detail, but I'll try to sort of you know, break it down to the, 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 the bare basics. Um, you take two electrons and you pair them together through kind of a technical process. Uh, you, you do this, put each one in a closed box so you can't see them. You don't know what position they're in. Um, when that happens, they exist in what's called a superposition. That is, they exist in multiple different states at the exact same time. If you've heard of a, uh, the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, that's exactly what this is about. The cat is alive and dead. The electron is in this position and in that position at the exact same time. Uh, now, uh, you, you can pair these two, and then if you look at one of them, open up the box for one, uh, uh, the superposition will collapse, um, the wave function will resolve into a definite state, and you know, here's the crazy thing, is that if we look at this one, we already know what position this one is in, even without looking at it, because of the, because of the pairing process. Now here's the relevant part for this discussion here. The explanation of why this electron in the box over here uh, is in the given state it is can be cashed out entirely in terms of the other electron. And the other electron can be, uh, the explanation for why the other electrons in that state can be cashed out entirely in terms of the electron that has been unobserved. And moreover, there is no possible explanation of why this pair of electrons exists in this state outside of those two electrons themselves. I'll, I'll try to summarize the core point this way. Our common sense notions of things like cause and effect, contingency and necessity, and so forth, these things just break down when we start looking at things that are really huge like cosmology or things that are really small like quantum mechanics. And we really have no reason at all to trust those common sense notions as universal absolutes. Um, next up, um, the argument from Alexander Pruss that you cite, the epistemic argument uh, for the principle of sufficient reason. Based on your summary, I gotta say that really doesn't sound like a very good argument. Uh, even if he's right, even if that war argument is completely uh, uh, sound with regard to you know, us knowing about the external world, at best, that proves that sometimes there are sufficient reasons. It doesn't prove that there are always sufficient reasons. The principle might not be universal. It might apply legitimately in certain contexts, like our knowing the external world, and not apply in other contexts, like Big Bang cosmology or quantum mechanics. Uh, at least as you presented that argument, I find it to be a, a, really a terribly weak argument. May, maybe, maybe you didn't present it well, or maybe I've misunderstood it, and if so, by all means, correct me. But uh, on the face of it, it doesn't sound terribly persuasive.